All right, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to take a moment and give you a very warm welcome to Light Iron. Uh, my name is Kim Snyder, and I am the CEO and president of Panavision. So welcome to Light Iron, a Panavision company. Uh, it's been four years already since we had the pleasure of coming together and bringing Light Iron into the Panavision family. And even though it's been four years, I still get really excited about introducing the company in that way because they are such an important part of our portfolio. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to say that. Um, I'd say that many of you have been following Panavision for a very long time. You're familiar with us. You know what we're all about. And when I have an opportunity to speak with you, I think, OK, what is the key you know, few sentences that I would want to leave with all of you? And I think that is the following. Um, Panavision is a company that focuses on technology, creativity, and customer service. And what we work really hard at is looking for that sweet spot, the intersection of technology and creativity so that we can really maximize the ability to service our customers in the pursuit of their creative intent. And that's really what we are about as a company. All of us are operating in an industry right now where you know, if you, you read about it, people say this is the golden age of content. Um, I don't know if it's the golden age. I think it's certainly a golden age because there's so much content being produced. Um, for us, as we think about supporting our customers producing content, we really think it's important to focus on the ecosystem. So we're talking about from camera, capture, to final cut. And it's important for us as a company, Panavision and all of our subsidiaries, to support our customers across the imaging chain. So I hope that you'll be excited about some of the things that we're going to preview for you this evening. And without further ado, I will say thank you again for being here. And I'd like to introduce Michael Cioni. Uh, Michael is the founder of Light Iron, as you all know. Um, he heads up our innovation department for all of Panavision on a global basis. Uh, was instrumental in being the project manager for DXL four years ago and continues to bring really exciting things to the company. So, uh, Michael, I'll turn it over Thank to you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Cool. Well, thanks again, everyone, for coming. It's awesome to have you guys here, many of you coming year after year, which means a lot. You guys are really important to us because I consider a lot of you not just friends, but also really influential people. And it's really great that our community is able to communicate through techniques like this because so much of how we communicate is through you know, the human interaction and the, and the direct interaction with each other. I think the, the world has certainly changed, but our market has changed too in how we communicate and how we learn and what we like and what we don't like and how we can influence manufacturers and we can influence technology. And it's just like so many of you, we've been doing this, Danny, Mark, you know, over the years we, we've communicated, you know, and we've made products better because of that. You know, Patrick, like these are, this is how we make things better. So we're not here just presenting to you we're here collaborating with you because this is how we make it better and this is where it starts and then we share this stuff so this information can just continue to evolve because we don't have all the answers you don't have all the answers but together we can triangulate all the answers and that's what i think true innovation is all about and i think that's what true collaboration is all about and so thank you again for being part of those influencers and for also contributing on so many different levels from, from the creative side, uh, Jan and Glenn, thank you, you know, so many great uh, ways that we communicate. So what's really exciting today is we are going to um, talk about some new things and uh, this is all part of the communication going forward. So I first want to invite Mike Mickens up here and Mike's going to join us and he's going to take us a little bit through the Lee filter side because so much has been changing on how people are shooting they're not just always on the cinema systems, they're using a lot of different other systems as well. So let's welcome Mike up and we're gonna look at something Thank new. You. Thank you. Okay, so I'm new to this side of the camera. I did 30 years on the other side. So um, I wanna show the new 100 millimeter system that we put out and basically this has been around for about 25 years, uh, this system, but mainly known by uh, landscape photography. When I came aboard about a year ago, I said, why don't we kind of market toward the video crowd? There's all these new cameras that are shooting video. So I said, you know, this kind of system would be ideal for, you know, a lot of guys who shot um, DSL uh, cameras, they have still lenses. They need a screw on, you know, filters and 
the system. So I said, why don't we have a new system? The system will work great. We could stick it on. All you have to do is buy a different adapter for each kind of lens that you own. So you can also get our IRND kind of glass in here. This is a resin version. We also have two millimeters. It's the same glass that we make for Panavision. Lean Filters makes their ND filters. Uh, we also have, it has, comes with a Pola. You can buy this kit. It's kind of a new looking design. So that's our new product. And then we have the Pro Glass. This is what we make. You can buy the glass that we make for Panavision through the Lee store. So just go to leefilters.com. Uh, so this is our new stuff. We have all spec sheets. Anybody wants to see the specs on it? It's a really nice piece of neutral density. And uh, you can buy it directly. So. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. That's good. What we've been finding at Panavision is so many people are actually using uh, you know, not just the cinema cameras for a lot of different types of shots. So you end up using SLRs and cameras like that. And we want to outfit them with the same technology and the same equipment. And so that's what Lee's been doing with those adapters is now when you have a specific setup with your cinema system, you can mirror a lot of that same technology with uh, these tools. And so you can have that on dashboards, you can have it in crash cams, you can have it in crash housings, um, underwater housings, it's common to use those types of tools as well. So trying to connect those together is an important component to this. So next we're gonna wanna talk a little bit about the optics side of things. And uh, optically speaking, Panavision has, you know, tens of thousands of lenses in the inventory over the course of over 65 years. So there's a lot of that going. But this whole new craze has been happening. You might have heard of this thing called large format. So I wanna invite Aaron Kroger to come up and speak a little bit about our optics. All right, so uh, at CineGear this year, we're going to have uh, similar to what we've had in years past is a, a lens bar. So we have the opportunity for you all to take a look at our different lenses and compare. So one of the things we're really trying to highlight is at Panavision, we are really the leader in large format. So we have the largest selection in terms of quantity and in terms of diverse looks. So I think that's one of the really important things with, with it. It's not just that we have a large quantity of large format optics for all of the modern cameras. It's that we have such a diversity. So we can go from uh, something, a very clean look of a Primo 70 all the way to a very classic portrait look on our H series and really everything in between. So we have just the largest palette for the cinematographers to just hone in the exact look that they want. So I think it's gonna be really exciting. Cool, thank you Aaron. Large format glass is really about the flavor. I mean, if you think about it, what we're really trying to do is give people more and more flavors. One of the challenges a lot of the manufacturers in the glass world have is they have to sort of pick and stick with the flavor. If they change too often, it's hard to get people to stay um, significantly invested in it. What's the advantage on the Panavision side is that we can keep releasing more and more variations on different prescriptions so that it keeps changing and those prescription, prescriptions can rapidly change based on user feedback. So we're able to sort of follow the trends that are happening because we sort of keep an eye on what people are shooting and how they're shooting it and then that inspires us to make more lenses like that and so that's sort of this rapid response option that we have by being able to manufacture. And that's a pretty exciting way to do that. Speaking of manufacturing, this is sort of um, pretty exciting for us because we have continued to work on this product. And it's, it's the DXL2 camera. And as Kim mentioned, this camera came out four cine years ago. So this is our fourth birthday of the DXL announcement, which is pretty exciting. And in that process, we came up with the, uh, the, the DXL system, and the original code name for that camera actually had the word system in it, because we knew our plan was not to make a camera based on a specific um, look and a specific time. Our plan was to grow an ecosystem and allow it to evolve. Our partnership with RED allowed us to create a hardware and software partnership that allowed us to change it and evolve it as time went on. If you think back, you know, it sort of always makes me rack my brain. I'm like, man, I just wish we could have had all these features on day one. Why didn't we think of that? And it's like, it just, it doesn't work that way. Any of you that have built anything know version one is always version one. And, and you can't have version two until there is a version one. And that's just the sad truth of this stuff. But it's motivating us to keep evolving the system. And so we're gonna take a look at um, uh, some pictures that were used to manufacture uh, a lot of parts of the camera and talk about some of the newest things that are coming out. Because 
Uh, this is where the DXL2 technology is heading forward and where our roadmap goes. And essentially, we're right on schedule with also how the community is starting to respond and react to how they expect cameras to perform. All right, so what's really cool about this, as I mentioned, is this is about being part of an ecosystem. And we're trying to evolve that. And workflow is king. I mean, this is the word everyone used. In fact, I'm sick and tired of that word workflow, so let me put a bounty out. If anyone can come up with a new word to describe workflow, you win the prize, because we all need it desperately. So we can start describing something new, because it's just overused and it means too many things now. So there's a, there's a challenge for the community. So um, essentially what we have here is uh, a, a, we're starting to really get excited about a goal we've been trying to achieve for now many years. Four years in the DXL program, we are trying to achieve a goal of making the most fully featured camera on the market. And I believe with this latest updates, we have now achieved unequivocally the most fully featured cinema professional camera system on the market. And that's really what we're after because we understand that all these cameras make amazing pictures. There's so many choices with regards to how many cameras can make an excellent picture. This is why we know that part of the reason people choose cameras is not solely based on how they look anymore. It's becoming more based on how they work. And that involves an entire large group of people that are part of the recipients of all the footage that a camera records. And so we need to factor how all the people that are not necessarily shooting with the camera are responsible for their role based on what the camera delivers them. And so this is what the DXL story has continued to uh, grow. So I'm gonna invite Aaron Kroger to come back up here and take us through uh, the DXL2. All right, so as... Um we already, we already talked about one of the really cool things. This is actually the fourth Cine Gear for DXL2. Um, and again, this is our, you know, our flagship camera. It's a, the Monstro large format sensor giving us um, 8K resolution. It's 16-bit, it's 1600 ISO with 16 stops of latitude. Um, and as Michael said, we've really just tried to cram as many features in but also not just putting them all in, but making them modular features so you can pick and choose and really customize it to exactly what you want. Kind of new to CineGear, some of the really cool features that we're continuing to develop. And again, even though this is the, this is the fourth CineGear, we're continuing every year, we're continuing to add more and more features into this camera. And I think that really goes to show how our modular approach to this camera allows us to continue to make new uh, developments. On this right now, we have, this is one of our latest modules, and this is the, um, our wireless audio module. So this is actually uh, built into the side of the camera here is a ComTech receiver. So on set, uh, as many of you are familiar, ComTech is a very common brand you're used to having for, um, for your headphones on set so you can hear the scratch track. Um, so what we did is we actually integrated this module directly into the camera, so now, with our proxy workflows, we can actually have that scratch track embedded uh, right into that proxy file. So we have uh, a few different options with that. We can go uh, in, last year we showed our D to E, which is a, a function where we can actually embed our, our CDL and our LUT into that proxy. So now, in a situation where you wouldn't use a traditional dailies lab, you can actually take the files straight from the DXL, the proxy files, they now have your look, they now have your CDL, and they now have a scratch track. So you can actually take these and drop them straight into an editor and start cutting right away. So I think that's a, this is a really exciting thing. And even if you're not, even if you're using a traditional dailies process, now you have proxy files immediately. As soon as you download your mag, 
that you can use for review. Um, maybe you have it on your DIT card if you want to go back, review some takes. So you have that built in. Um, an additional module that uh, we came out with is um, our new C-Motion module for the Fizz control. So um, last year and previous years, we've had the uh, Preston module. So again, this is a um, interchangeable module. So we can go from on the same camera body, we can go from a Preston, an RT motion, or a Teradek RT, I'm sorry, and a, um, now a C-Motion. And one of the really cool things with the C-Motion is that it allows use with the Airy WCU4 handset. So this is really big. Um, customers here, especially for our European customers, they are big fans of this WCU4 handset. So now with DXL, uh, and especially paired with our Primo 70s or our Primo RTs, Primo X, we can actually use a WCU4 handset to control the wireless motors within the lens. Um, and if you're not using this in another series of lenses, we can still connect to external C-Force motors. And again, we have the full functionality of an Airy wireless system or a C-Motion, uh, but integrated in the camera. So again, no cables, no GAC, just clean builds, especially when you're going with the, with the internally motorized lenses. Um, another thing that's really cool that we added, well, actually, that we didn't add. It's actually one of the things I think is fun is that four Cine gears ago, the, the camera that we showed, uh, SDI 4 and 5, they were 6G 4K SDI outputs. And at the time, it was a little bit like, what are those for? Uh, 4K monitors weren't even that prevalent. And then again, we had this issue. Even, even more today, we have, these are some 4K monitors. But there was a, there was a missing link, because on set, no one loves cables. So um, another, another thing, our friends over at uh, Teradek, over at Vitek, created the uh, Bolt 4K wireless transmitter, which is now out. So what's really great is a feature that's actually been on DXL from the beginning. Um, we can now, with a single, single link SDI, we can actually go 4K SDI into the Bolt. And now we're able to transmit that back to our village and into some of these products that we're actually going to show you a little bit later. And this will really help make our ecosystem fully functional um, from end to end. We also have some updates to DXL control. It's now available live in the Android store um, for free, and again, iOS also. Yeah, so again, this is just the latest uh, development, and we'll continue to add more and more. And so uh, come check it out at CineGear. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. And what's, what's really great about everything that you see right here, which is something that's very remarkable for anyone that here that is using cameras on a regular basis, this is a picture of every single part now. This is. This has got your onboard monitor, your proxy files, your color, your LUT, and CDL, thanks to Pomfret LiveGrade. We've got our wireless audio, and we've got wireless transmission, and it's clean. It's clean, you know? And that's one of the most important things, is to give people more functionality. And people are like, can you make the camera smaller? Well, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But if you want to have everything on a camera, it starts to get messy. And so this is a ton of engineering that a whole bunch of great people, and Dominic Gael is going to speak in a moment, who has a lot to do with this, have tried to make this as clean and available as possible. So this is really, really exciting going forward. So that's a good cue to get into the next uh, step here. And so people do say, well, what about when I need something smaller? What about something that has a little bit more flexibility in terms of size and weight and when you're doing gimbals, you're doing drones and you need smaller rigs and stuff like that. So this is really important is we wanted to get into uh, optimizing a DXL that could work in a smaller form factor. Now there's a lot of great cameras that have really small form factors and we can take advantage of them. But one of the problems that people have is they say, well I want to use a smaller camera, but I want to have access to some of the functionality and features that you put in into DXL. And so this is where we come to our next uh, little uh, vignette here, where we talk about how we've been able to engineer uh, this product to fit that request and requirement. And everything you're about to see um, is really cool in this piece because we built this hardware all inside of a building in Woodland Hills. And so the manufacturing team at Panavision doesn't just do optics. It's also got an electronics and manufacturing uh, wing. And so uh, this is really, really special for us to be able to bring you a little bit behind the scenes into the part of Panavision that most people don't get to walk into and take a look at uh, the beginnings of our DXL-M.
it's really great to be able to kind of take you through behind the scenes there and take a look at that. So the DXL2 is the sort of beginning of this because a lot of times when people move to those smaller cameras, as I mentioned, they're missing a lot of these key functions and key features like power, uh, like menu control, like the quality of our viewfinder, things like that. And there's a lot of demand for that. A lot of times people will want a major studio camera like a DXL and then they'll take a small camera as a third or fourth separate body. And so this helps bring those two worlds together and so uh, the RED DSMC2 is the platform that we're able to mate with. So RED makes essentially three main, main products. They make a Monstro, a Helium, and a Gemini that give you 8K and Super 35 uh, choices. And we can mate the DXLM with any of those DSMC2 bodies. And then the rest of the system is able to work around it. And we've worked really, really hard to make all this work together. And so I want to invite Dominic Aiello up, who is the lead designer on this product. And he can take us through what he's been able to do. Hey, Dominic. This is all just in case I trip over the rat's nest that we just created over here. So, so thank you, guys. Um, DXLM, we did make this announcement last year, but we got a lot of feedback. Um, and in that feedback, we actually took that all in and revamped, come back out with more features into this. So last year, we demonstrated the very first parts of being able to control our 70 series lenses on a camera that wasn't meant to, for it to be built in. So this here now actually has a Preston controlling our internally motorized lenses through a DSMC2 body. We are going through an external MDR at this point, but this gives us that opportunity now to actually expand our internally motorized lenses to outside of just DXL. We also went to uh, um, pushing onto the um, DXL control. We now actually showing Android DXL control on a DSMC2 body. Again, making this so that our uh, DXL menu structure now, what is now becoming a standard for people, they, they understand those menus very easily, now can do that through a DSMC2 body. Um, one of the things, if you guys know me, you know that I'm always about ergonomics. I'm always trying to find a better way for uh, the users actually to use the cameras. Changeovers are important. Uh, how quickly can you change from one mode to another and cutting down that time? I come from the film days. I've been with Panavision for over 24 years before digital was a thing. And one of the things was trying to convert a gold two into Steadicam mode. It was 35 screws. There was four different types of screws. And you would lose at least a third of them during each of the changeovers. <laughs> so with that in mind, it was always that ingrained thing of one, teaching somebody how to do it, teaching them how not to lose the screws. And then at the same time, that time involved and how much you could see in the assistant's face of, I have to tell a director it's going to take this amount of time. So over the years, we've gotten better and better at that. In DXL, we demonstrate how we can take off that uh, camera right off of a studio mode and pop it right onto a steady cam. But one of the feedbacks we got, again, even last year, was we had very little side-to-side -side adjustment on a steady cam rig. And so this year, we decided to take another look at that. So now we actually have a, a still a very, very fast way of removing the system off the head. But now we can actually bounce right back onto a steady cam plate that stays on the rig itself using the same mounting system. This allows the side to side adjustment across that plate. So now they can get optimal balance. There's marks on the plates to allow them to repeat that over and over again. So they can mark that spot that they like. Maintaining balance, maintaining the fast changeovers, and making it easy for our crews. Ergonomics and speed of change was a big deal. So the other part for handheld, again, DXL, we decided our, when we put it up on the shoulder, it, it, felt, it felt fine, but it felt top heavy, like most cameras do. So we decided to build the at battery elevator, which lowered the center of gravity of that camera. And I'll tell you, even over the, through the last couple years, I've had a few of camera or, uh, operators actually tell me, yeah, that's hocus pocus. And after a whole series, the last two weeks of the series, They've been working with the camera for four months. Last two weeks that they're on, their assistant decides to pull a prank and they drop the battery down on them. And all of a sudden they're like, hey, how come this feels so good? I literally had the operators come to me and tell me, look, I believed it was hocus pocus, but it worked. Last year we did not have this. This year we actually have 
the battery elevator belt back onto there. That also helps in Steadicam. Lowering that center of gravity allows you to shorten the rig, allow, again, allowing the operator to move quickly and easily with that. So ergonomics, internally motorized lenses, and the DXL control have all added to the feature set of DXLM. Well, we have more video outs now on this camera. So we actually changed, uh, last year we had HDMI uh, and two video outs. And so this year we actually have uh, two clean, or two different video outs, but each one has two outputs. So there's four outputs on there, but two independent outputs on that. So we actually have the ability on this camera to actually have a log output as well as a, a look output. That again is adding to the usability on set. So adding those features on there, we can do audio on there in these new modules. We can actually do uh, time code, gen lock. Uh, all of the features are, are the same connectors that they're used to on the DXL. So accessories are cross-platform. So with that, thank awesome. you guys. Thank you, Dom. It's a, big, it's a big achievement, and uh, being able to make people feel very fluid going from DXL to DXLM is exactly what we're after. But this is also a product we will rent by itself. So if it's the right product and the DXL isn't the best fit, this gives you an option, especially since it can be mated with any of the DSMC2 uh, ecosystem. So it's very, very handy in that scope of things. So now we're going to get to one of the coolest and most fun things and uh, something that we're just so excited to be shepherding and growing through this process, and that's the liquid crystal neutral density filter. And this is a really, really exciting time because, again, like the DXLM, one of the advantages that Panavision has with its business model is we are able to go to trade shows like Cinegear. We're able to gather feedback when we're in the beta phase. And I know some of you do the exact same things, and I really um, love that I, I see this, some of my friends like you doing the same technique where we're in the field, um, in the trade shows, and all of our friends are there, the users are there, and we're able to write down their stuff right then and there. I explain to people that when I go to NAB, I have 60 meetings in five days. Do you know how long it takes me to have 60 meetings? most of the year, you know? And then you go to NAB or Cinegear and you just can cram it in there and you can just take so many notes and get right back to the lab. And I think that's a fuel that lets us come back and apply what we learned going forward. That's exactly what happened last year with LCND. Haluki Satahiro is gonna come up in a moment. He basically was holding church for two days at Cinegear and he gathered all this feedback that we were able to spend the last 12 months improving upon. And where he and his team have uh, come to today is nothing short of, of, of remarkable. It's really, really very special stuff. So let's take a look, uh, a little behind the scenes look at how the LCND is put together and what that allows us to do. Then we'll, we'll bring Haluki up. This is pretty exciting because the LCND system is not just like for trick shots, right? This is a shot you saw a moment ago is a shot that's basically impossible to do today without having to adjust an iris, which is going to affect all sorts of other characteristics that you generally don't want to change. So this isn't just about trick shots, though. It's those moments where you're losing the light. The sun is going down. It's the most basic parts of the day where changing, pulling the crane down to change a filter means you lost a shot because you're going to give up shots when you're in that moment. It also means that as you're adjusting and sculpting lights, a cinematographer can just talk to a DIT or an AC, and they can make those adjustments on the filter directly, locally or remotely. And it's just really, really remarkable to kind of see how that comes together. So let me introduce the brain behind all this, Haluki Sadahiro, to take us through LCND. All right. Ride your filter, not your iris. I'll get into that. Um, 
In Panavision, every engineering project or every innovation starts with a question. And we always ask ourselves this question. It starts with, wouldn't it be great if? And that's typically what every engineering project starts with. And that's what fuels the engineering drive of being able to create something that's different. And it's going to be, be much, it's going to change basically how we actually do or how we shoot cinema. And for this LCND, we started with the question, wouldn't it be great if, if we had a filter that we don't have to swap out, we could dynamically change the density of it? Wouldn't it be great if, if we could remotely control it from a really far, far place? And wouldn't it be great if, if, we, if we're not plagued with some of the actual optical artifacts of some of the current variable ND filters? Wouldn't it be great if, if we could actually do all that in a very small package where we could fit it into a map box? Wouldn't it be great if, if we could actually battery operate it so we could kind of leave it and forget it, kind of like what we do with our glass NDs. So that's where, ND, that's where LCND came about. And last year at Cinegear, we kind of said, hey, we kind of asked that question, and we came out with the concept saying that, OK, wouldn't it be great if, if we could actually make this? And we did a technical showcase on LCND, and it was great. People actually chimed in saying that, yeah, that is great. Right? Why don't we do make that? And that's where we went into the actual product development of it. And I'm going to actually show you. I'll pass one around. Like, I'll go ahead. Um, so I'll describe to you exactly what it does. Very simple. Right? It's a, it's a, um, this is the LCND. Right? We have buttons on the side right here. The buttons on the side are up and down buttons. We could actually cycle through the ND stops. Right? Each, each button is one hard ND stop. You could go in between the stops, and you can kind of see a color code go on. Every hard stop is going to be, let me get to it, a white LED. But every in-between stop is going to be an in-between stop, or a different color. Right? What we can achieve, pop, pop this in the side of your map box, or it fits into basically your map box. It sticks out the side, and you could actually have control on the side dynamically. And also, the fact is that it is in a form factor where it could, where it could fit into our map boxes, and it will not interfere with other filtration uh, frames. The, the ability to actually have it op um, operating on its own is done by a battery. It's chargeable. The actual battery in calculation lasts about 24 hours. Um, so we could, we could actually charge it from externally as well. There's a LIMO connector on the outside to actually charge it with a 12-volt source. That could be found on some part of your camera, right? Um, so also, at the same time, what we wanted to do is we wanted to remote control it. Right? We wanted to give the user the ability to actually have it on the end of a crane. Magic hour. The exposure is changing every minute. You have to actually change your filter. Right? So the ability to actually change it remotely was essential for this. So that's what this kind of port is for. So, so now you can see. I'm not doing this. It's all Phil. Right? <laughs> I'm not touching anything. So what this is is a Preston single unit or single channel unit. Um, it can work with the HU3. The actual protocol being spoken to the MDR is the same protocol that, you know, that, that Preston speaks. The serial communication coming from the MDR is going into the filter, the LCND, and controlling the density of it dynamically. So you get the same range, same reliability, same connection as your Preston control, now controlling what used to be our FIZ. And in addition to that, you have filter. Right? So with this filtration, with this system, you could actually get the full range of movement between one to six stops. Not only that, what, you, what, we, what we will be able to do is that we could actually synchronize it with the iris. So what does that mean? You could actually ramp your iris or ramp your depth of field you can synchronize it where you could open up your iris and actually make it darker at the same time, doing a very cool trick shot. Right? So that's a good to have, but the, actual <coughs> the, the, the gist of the actual merit of having this is the ability to actually change your exposure on the fly, which is the reason why we say, hey, ride your filter, not your iris. The, the practice of riding your iris I guess is a practice to change and kind of fudge your exposure so you could actually get into exposure, but that's not good practice. We know that because it actually changes your depth of field. You want to actually do it in your filter as much as you can. Now you can. So the ability to actually change the light coming in rather than changing your aperture is the more ideal way of doing it, and that's what we can do with LCND. Right? So this is the LCND system.
it's amazing. It's amazing. So it's, it's really remarkable. And what, what Haluki and his team has done is nothing short of uh, fantastic. And for those of you in the camera community, you know this is game-changing stuff, and you know how much power can go into this. And so the ability to not just use it as a trick shot, which can be useful, it's very, very practical. We expect to see people want LCND for every single job because it's practical every day, you know? And so that's what's really cool about great technology is it just will seamlessly fill in, and people, we can already uh, anticipate saying, how did we do it without this stuff, you know? And that's really a good sign of great product development. So we're into our last section here. And uh, this is pretty interesting because there's one more thing that's really important to where we're going uh, as a community. And it's not just about cameras all the time. It's not just about looks or, or, uh, or even uh, color correction. It's about that workflow, that word that we need. And so what we are going to spend the last few minutes together talking about is high dynamic range. And this is really important because we all know these three letters. But uh, to quote uh, one of my mentors, Leon Silverman, if you're struggling with the technology of HDR, that's okay because the teacher is only one semester ahead of the student. That's how close this stuff is happening. So don't feel bad if some of this stuff feels very unfamiliar or it feels uh, un unsafe or risky or you've had bad experiences with it. We understand that people have had troubled times with HDR and those times aren't necessarily over and so we want to respond to that. Here's some interesting data that is really important about what's happening in the HDR world. The consumer electronics industry is exploding with this. In fact, the speed in which HDR 4K is being adopted by consumers is happening 66% faster than HD adoption 12 years ago. So if people are thinking that there's only like three guys at Best Buy that can see HDR 4K, that's not accurate at all. And so it's important that we as a community do not um, push myths that uh, stunt some of the progress because it's simply not true. Consumers whom we work for and whom we're able to generate the best quality we possibly can, which everybody uh, invested in watching this and watching this and, and appearing and uh, being with us here, we're all invested in giving the consumer the best possible experience. I, I think that's part of what drives us is trying to outdo ourselves so that we get home or go to a theater and see an image, it looks better than we ever thought it could ever be. That's one of these, like Haluki said, wouldn't it be great? But when you put HDR in the mix, we do have a problem. Even though it's being adopted 66% faster than HD, we know that at the end of 2019, right around Christmas time this year, a third of North America will be HDR 4K. And uh, Europe is about 20%, with uh, Britain at about a third of their uh, population as well. So we have a lot of movement happening in the international market and there's a lot of regional growth in a lot of these areas that is driving 4K HDR home to the consumers. But there's a problem with this because we're seeing this happen super fast but if we look at this there are four key collaborators that work with pictures when you're shooting and delivering anything. And we've got our cinematographer, our editor, of course visual effects supervisor in the VFX team and then color correction and then it goes to the consumer. But these four groups there's a huge problem. The problem is the groups that have HDR are not everyone. In fact it is very, very common that the first time many people see HDR is well after they shot something. And that's a problem. In fact, how many of you have a 4K HDR TV at home? I would say that's roughly a third, which means we are statistically correct in how many of us have adopted 4K HDR. And uh, that makes sense. But my guess is by Christmas time, another bunch of you will probably have invested in one of these devices and having that. And this is the problem that we have is we need to make sure that we have a solution that is able to link together all the people that are actually using HDR at the end of the process with the people at the beginning of the process. This is probably one of the most important things that can happen over the next four years. I don't want to say you put anything else you're working on on hold, but if what you're working on does not include solutions for high dynamic range, someone else is going to do it for you. 
And so it's very critical that we look into the solution. And Panavision and LightIron have given a lot of thought to this. This is something that we've been passionate about. We've been working on this for a couple of years. And thanks to many of you who have also put integration into this, we have something to show you. So let's take a look at the beginning of something new. So this is uh, something we're just thrilled about. I am so excited about how this uh, goes. And, and it's important that we help everyone understand this because like I mentioned, this is new stuff and there's gonna be a lot of misinformation about this. And so we need to work together as a community to understand this. But White Iron and Panavision are taking a step forward in order to link together all these solutions. And so we're gonna start by looking at what we're doing on the onset side. So what we have here is really exciting. And thanks to a, a, a contributing factor of Sony and Sony two years ago, we had a discussion about where this roadmap wanted to go and they were able to respond to some of the technology wanted. This is really, really exceptional stuff because now we have HDR, PQ, uh, monitors that are available for on, on the set and they're built in Panavision ruggedized cases so basically I say like this thing could tumble down the stairs and while it will break the monitors they will not come off the cart so <laughs> this is this is the most important thing um, these displays allow us to give people um, either an HDR display but we know for the next um, cycle, which I'll say is about five years, we're going to have to be delivering simultaneous HDR and SDR deliverables. So we program this with a one-touch solution to be in SDR monitoring or you can be in HDR monitoring and we can do that simultaneously. We can set that one or the other or you can do two on one monitor or as you just saw here, I can do them both at the same time. So this allows us to integrate the outputs of our DXL camera because we have so many outputs. Um, it has the most outputs of any camera if you're counting and that allows us to be able to service this really, really well. However, this will work with any camera and so we have the ability to integrate Link HDR on set with any of the popular cameras that people use. We're able to transform those in the systems here. The second system uh, uses the Sony X310, which gives us a thousand nit and it gives us a 31 inch display. Now some people will say um, this is uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, too much, but here's one of the advantages of this system and this is what Sony uh, engineered um, for our request that was able to make this really exceptional. You can actually look at this in full screen 31 or we can go one touch and now we can make four 15 inch displays and we can look at the same shot A and B camera in HDR or SDR, 1000 nits or 100 nits at the same time. So we're doing the transform so that you can do a simultaneous display in both gamuts at the same time. This is gonna be so critical over the next few years because this is the world we have to consider. There are people that say that, you know what, just shoot your image the way you've always shot it and we'll deal with it in post. That is absolutely okay to do, but I posit that it is not ideal. It is not the best way to treat your footage, to just shoot it as you normally would and deal with the HDR pass later. You are leaving something out when you do that. However, it will work if you do it that way. You can monitor an SDR and convert it later, but we've created a solution where you don't have to make that compromise. You can go into the set and make sure that you're making the perfect decision the entire way through. So these two solutions can also be part of a lot of configuration. Not everyone wants the same configuration. So the genius in the design of these modular carts is they can be one by one, two by two, they can be three by one. So there's all these different configurations you can see here. So if you wanna take one display, two display, the big one or the small one, we can configure the cart based on your needs. High chairs, low chairs, um, 
Are you going to be standing or sitting? Uh, do you want the quad view or just one or single? So this is what's really cool about this is, again, we're trying to be super custom and allow this stuff to shape and tailor itself to the way that you work. And the displays and the transforms allow us to do that. So that is Link HDR on set. But then we cannot leave something off the table because it's imperative that anyone that is going to engage with HDR on the set must follow that through with editorial. The reason is the people that get acclimated to HDR on the set, this is a win because today we don't have this solution. But the problem is we don't want them to spend six months in a cutting room looking at something else because then when they come to the DI at the end, we've had to reset our minds again. So we have a failed solution. So that's why we move into Link HDR dailies. And our friends at Colorfront have helped us be able to use this. This is something that we use at LightIron and all the LightIrons are powered by the Colorfront engine for our express rendering. What's great about this is we are able to deliver HDR or SDR material for the web. Now today, you're not seeing HDR over your mobile devices in the form of dailies, but you will. And this will wake up very, very quickly. And there are people working on this right now, and there are hardware devices in the form of eye devices that will be HDR PQ capable in the next cycle of technology. When that happens, people are going to start expecting to see HDR on their phone. So we are ready for that right now. But the other side of this is going to be based on how people are in the cutting room. So we can start with our image here, and thanks to the work at Colorfront, we can have an SDR and HDR deliverable pre-built and then that information is going to be sent to our nonlinear system. So, um, in our nonlinear world, we can look at an image here. And uh, this is a, uh, I wanted to kind of give an example here. So, here you can see this is, uh, there's something wrong with this photo, which I'm going to fix in a second. So, take a look at this. There we go. That's the <laughs> one. Yeah, so. Um, so, what's happening here is that now we have a solution. Uh, that's really important because if we look at this picture here, we can uh, deliver an editor an HDR solution as well. So and now what we can do is he can switch to SDR and now we're looking at the signal in SDR. So the edit system is set up, and of course I can play that back, um, we can be either in HDR or we can switch back to SDR, or we're in SDR right now, we could switch back to HDR and in that process now we have um, that. So now we're able to see the HDR is happening in the monitor, in the display, and now a cutting room can either work in HDR or SDR at the same time. And so the solution we have with Avid is leveraging the 3D tools so that if you're doing outputs where they're HDR capable, you simply edit, you output that way, and vice versa if it's SDR. This does not interrupt the edit process. It doesn't require one second of extra rendering. It does not require anybody to have to set up anything any different than they've set up a, a number of projects in this type of form. And it's very, very fast to switch between the two. So uh, what we recommend is having a, a monitor like this, which is an LG E7, which allows you to have HDR um, for around $1,000, this is a really affordable solution for cutting rooms to be able to take any computer, connect it HDR, take the dailies, and now the idea that you're seeing here is a matched solution linking together what we see in the camera, what we see in these displays on set, what we see in post, which then eventually will go into the DI facility. When we get to HDR link finish, we have the ability to do what we do best at LightIron, and that is to do excellent color correction finishing, cutting edge, and extremely clever artistic solutions that are trend setting through this business. And what we are passionate about is the people that are in the room like you're in today, which have access to all the same technology, is being fed back. What we don't want is for any of you that raised your hand that have a superior television that can do 4K HDR, the worst thing that can happen is that a cinematographer has an inferior product when they're shooting this in the first place. And that, unfortunately, is rampant today. And so what we have to do is change that so the cinematographer has the same access to the high quality pictures these cameras are capable of that a colorist does. And we're bringing the colorist's tools and instrument to the cinematographer and the editors aren't left out in the middle. 
And so everybody participates in this link process that allows us all to be feeding this from start to finish. And that is exactly uh, what is uh, it, it's super important in our industry. And our, con our, our community is hungry for this. And we know that for those of you that have struggled with HDR or you don't like it, this is the first step to making sure that we're doing it correctly. Because I challenge you that if you had a bad HDR experience, something was wrong with the experience, not what's wrong with the HDR spec. And so we want to help make sure that that spec is followed correctly and the experience will be easy and it'll be better. And we've gone through these challenges over the years with all sorts of different technologies. I think this is as challenging as getting people to go from analog to digital. It's not nearly as hard as going from 2K to 4K. That was actually not that bad. I think HDR is going to be a lot more complicated because there's so many new components that didn't previously exist. And I think that creates fear in the industry. But make no mistake, our consumers are moving by the tens of millions to this. And inside of two years, it will be more than 50% of the world's way to consume your pictures. And so we have to solve that problem today so that we're always making the best pictures we can because that's what we do. So LiDAR and Panavision are committed to delivering a linkable HDR experience from start to finish. And we want to help work with the community to integrate those. And, and our friends um, that have made some of these tools make this possible. And so that's why we have to keep up the communication. None of this would be possible if we didn't have these meetings and have these friendships and relationships. And that's why we spend time putting on events like this, because we can't do it all, and neither can you. And that's what we've really been focused on, and uh, Link HDR is a picture of that. So this is what we wanted to share with you today. We've really just been hard at work. I mean, I know everybody is um, you know, building great things out there, and we are absolutely committed to building an, a powerful ecosystem that serves more and more people globally. And we're listening to the trends creatively and technologically and making sure that we are able to deliver you exactly the best that we possibly can to make and elevate those pictures even better. That's what this is all about, and I know a lot of you are believers in that as well. So let's keep these conversations going, and let's make sure that as we go into the future, we're always focused on the fringes, because it's always out there. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a long-distance runner, and I'm a long-distance thinker, and that's the type of stuff that really motivates me to make sure that we're doing that, and I know many of you feel the same way. So thank you for your support over the years, and thanks to this amazing team of people that have assembled all this together. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Appreciate it. <laughs>